Good morning, lovely people. Thank you so much for being here at such an early time of day on the second day of Woodhull. I'm Nina Hartley. I am Ellen Willard. And thank you all for coming. And we want to thank Woodhull for being willing to host this workshop, um, The Preacher and the Porn Star. We are not two people who are usually put together to talk and talk in a productive caring, interested in what each other has to say kind of way. We're usually set up like we're supposed to be natural enemies, right? Uh, but we're actually quite good friends. So to have a forum where we can admit that and be open about that and discuss it and talk about what we have gotten from each other in this relationship is really fabulous. So thank you for having us here. Um, my name is Ellen Willert. I am a, I hold a Master in Divinity. I, I am a Member in discernment in the United Church of Christ, which means I am a minister pursuing ordination. And one of the things that really, really matters to me is how do we get the healing message that the church has out to people who will never think to walk through our doors for whatever reason, either because they physically can't or because they hold some internal sense of unworthiness. And I'm a person thinking of my life working in and on behalf of the church, I feel very called to serve anyone in the margins. And if I'm going to be working in and on behalf of the church, then I think my first responsibility is really to those who the church is pushing to the margins. So that has led me to be a strong and vocal advocate for the decriminalization of all consensual sex work as a social justice and human rights issue. Um, I've also done work with prisoners on issues of restorative justice and um, as the child of an army officer I have a lot of passion for returning soldiers and working on issues of moral injury and soul repair and actually these three groups have more overlap in their experience and how society sees them or doesn't see them than you might think. And um, some of you may know I've been making adult videos since 1984. Um, I, my background spiritually is, you know, I'm culturally Jewish. My parents found Zen Buddhism when I was 10 and stayed there for 45 years until their deaths. So the <clears throat> central tenets of Zen Buddhism are what I use for my philosophical underpinnings. Um, I know a little bit about Jewish culture, but I was not raised within um, any kind of Western religion. And so it turns out that the tenets of Buddhism, the three main ones, are compassion, personal responsibility, and mindfulness. They overlap quite a great deal, as it turns out, with what Ellen uh, knows to be her spiritual practice. And so we've come, we come, we are going to the same location through two different avenues, and the shared, av the shared vessel is the body, the human body, what we are given, uh, what we are born with, and how do we get to a state where, as she likes to say, our insides match our outsides, where our behaviors match our values? And that means a practice, a spiritual practice, a sex practice, a body practice, some kind of returning regular focusing point to help us understand the sacred. Um, and which, the sacred is an issue that I have, have had a really hard time coming to because I was like, ah, oh, nah, 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 ah, who needs that? I don't need that. Turns out we all need that however we define it. We both sort of come back to the body and center on the body. Um, for me, there, it's a real grounding in my theology is that we, we're created beings, holy, in the image and likeness of the divine. And that means all of us, all of, and all parts of us. So our bodies aren't an accident of creation. It's not an unfortunate side effect of our creation. It's not this unintended consequence that we somehow have to fight against and overcome. It is foundational to who we are. If we look at that foundational myth of the Abrahamic faiths, the, the body was formed first from the earth and then the breath of life, the soul of life, was breathed in to us. So the body really, really matters. And if we accept an incarnational theology, and Christians claim we do, those things together means all of us are holy, and that includes our bodies, and that includes our sexuality. 
Sorry, church people. I know that's hard to hear, but it does. <laughs> so one of the things I'm, is, that's really important to me is explicating for people a theology of the body and sexuality that isn't rooted in a whole lot of shame a whole, and a whole lot of fear. Or a whole lot of mindless hedonism. You know, the whole idea, I can do what I want, you know. Yes, we can do what we want, but sometimes what we want isn't healthful, isn't kind, isn't useful, isn't a good idea, and can be downright cruel, mean, and overtly harmful. So we carry around these bodies with their urges and their need to connect. My touch your knee? Mm-hmm. I mean, bodies need, bodies need contact. Babies who receive insufficient contact have a lifelong condition after it's called failure to thrive and if you feed a baby and keep a baby diapered and warm but don't hold it hug it touch it talk to it look it in the eye it will die human infants will die without this i love you i see you i love you oh my goodness so eye contact it really goes right to the parts of the brain that help us be seen feel seen be connected and part of what started me on my journey toward this spiritual thing was something I had happen when I was 12 years old. So you remember, I tell you, you said you were talking to God in your crib when you were three and that younger, it's my first, I moved to my a different room when I was three. So I remember lying in my original room in my crib, looking at the, the ceiling of my room, just listening to God is my first memory in, in life. People do that. So I was coming from much more, um, farther away place of spirit or, uh, integration. And I was 12 when I first had a, the first time I experienced compassion and someone looking at me like, how are you doing? I was 12 years old. And in that second, I r- discovered three things. It had never happened before in my entire 12 years. It burned like fire and I needed it like water. So that set me off on and here I'm here I'm sitting today, 45 years later, <laughs> and, but it works. So I came to a, I started my practice a long time ago. You started yours a long time ago. And here we are in the same area because the spirit is housed in our meat sacks. You know, it's, it, 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 it's, it's that this is the, this is the vessel for which our spirit has to walk around and spirit sees spirit, right? And that's why as a pansexual person, I don't require that my lover be a certain gender or look a certain way. If I like you, I like you. And the way I am, if I like you, I will probably want to explore maybe being naked with you in some way because that's me. Um, so it got to the same place through, through totally different means. And so there's some, I'm going to say uni- what the universal because all people need connection. I, I would say universal, and that was part of the motivation for why I wanted to present this workshop, was an experience I had here last year talking to faith leaders, talking to clergy, talking to other seminary students. I was a seminary student at the time, and I showed up thinking, like, I am going to be really the odd person out here, and I wasn't at all, uh, but I noticed through my conversations that sort of predominantly in this population and to a lesser extent people who are here as social workers or psychotherapists um, and certainly sex workers were sort of all dealing with the same thing like from someone who works in ministry it really it matters to me that this message gets out it matters to me that we can embrace and honor our sexuality and not have it be a source of guilt and shame and I was talking to a lot of people with the same audience and the same sphere of influence as myself, and everyone was pretty much saying, this really matters to me, but how do I be a voice for that and not lose my job? And how can I, how do I integrate these two things because it is so ingrained? And also I noticed a lot of those people were wearing the lanyard saying, please don't take my picture. Like, I mean, I'm even scared that anyone will know I'm here. And, um, um, I'm sure my husband will back me up on this. Like, there's, like, don't tell me I can't do something. I'm pretty stubborn and pretty determined. And I'm like, and so what? this matters to me. So if this needs a voice, I'll be the voice because I believe it and I can, gra- I can ground it in theology. I'm not just saying, well, if this is how I want to behave and I'm going to do what I want to do. I can ground this from a place of spirituality. So 
I'm and willing to. And to I can say ground that. it from a place of uh, science. Please come in, please. Yay. Welcome. I know. Do please. Mob. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Please have a seat. That's great. I love angry women. Angry women are changing the world. You're awesome. Thank you for being here. So, 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 um, so Ellen wants to ground her ideas in theology, and I like to ground my ideas in um, science and biology. And it turns out that um, the two overlap because, as Ellen likes to say, humans are meaning-making creatures. So when we have experiences, we need we like to assign them meaning and place. Where we assign the meaning and how we assign the meaning is often cultural, often heavily laden with dogma. Um, and at the but the, at the very so, if you think of the word sex, a lot of us will feel discomfort in our body somewhere. So. What should be, oh, yeah, my body, oh, it's nice to be here. For a lot of us, it's not nice to be in our bodies for whatever reason. And so we seek um, therapy, we seek a preacher, we seek, uh, we may misuse sexuality as a way to soothe and calm ourselves or try to make connection because we are disconnected from ourselves. So what prayer does, what contemplation does, and what zazen, which is a sitting meditation uh, that Zen uh, folk do. Um, what that does is it quiets our body and allows us to focus on our breathing and observe our minds. And I observe how I do my pain and you observe how you do your pain and you do your pain. And we all do our pain differently. So finding a place of stillness so we can just be aware of ourselves is a first step. And there's there's lots of pain that's a whole lot easier, like emotional pain or psychic pain that's easier to sit with than sexual pain because there has been so much shame piled on it. And, you know, I, I will own that the church has contributed to that. And that's part of the reason I feel so called to do this work because some of the messages that the wider church is putting out, we're literally killing people and that's not okay. Shame does so, kill. It does kill. And Christianity gets blamed for a lot of it. We did not invent purity culture. Admittedly, we took it and ran with it, but we didn't invent it. It was already in the this local culture. populations, it was in cultures that predated this one, in societies that predated this one. Um, so we didn't invent it. But what sort of mid-century American Christianity did do is sort of take all of the fear and all of the shame and all of the this need to sort of protect virtue and protect reputation and protect chastity and virginity whatever that is i don't honestly know um and say we're really really terrified of this we can find a couple of key phrases in scripture that can allow us to take our terror project it onto god and say look everybody you need to be scared of this too because it's coming from god it's not my fear it's not my insecurity so and that's not really fair and that's not really accurate so one of the things we hope to do today is share tools and a path for which the people that who are spiritual leaders, who are mental health professionals, who are sex workers, who are working with people who have problems that are rooted in the sexual shame, how can we help those people on the journey? And because we all grew up in the same toxic environment, like we all have our own shame, we all have our own issues to work through. And so for me, it's a, it's a process of discerning that I've done that I have to continue to do and those of us who work with people coming to us saying, help, we have to not tell people this is good and this is evil because honestly, our bodies and our sexualities are a gift from God, from, from my point of view. I, I use a lot, a lot of God language. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but it, they're a gift from God. And if there is any greater sin than just flat out rejecting as evil a gift from our creator, I don't know what it might be. So, so it's really important to me that we do this discerning work. So for me, it's not about assigning values to people's behaviors, but it's about helping them 
identify their values and aligning their behaviors with those values. So how do we do, how do, we do some that? of that work? I, I like to say there are no wrong thoughts, only wrong action. Um, so we can think anything we want. We can want anything we want, but we can't have anything we want. We can have what we negotiate. But we, so we, your, our desire is, it does not exist to hurt other people's feelings. Our desire does not exist to torment us. Our desire exists to show us what might be the way for us forward. Um, but how we exercise that desire, that really matters. Um, and so many people have sexual habits and they, and they say things, I can't help it. It just happened. I couldn't help it. I, I, what, what, of course I'm fill in the blank. And actually, uh, it's almost like a matrix thing. Between, no matter how small the synapse between impulse and action, that can be expanded into a cathedral. Once we just recognize that my behavior is under my control, I may not think so, but half of toddler training is helping them, have, helping them with young children with impulse control, right? So they can be socialized and not run into the traffic and not put their, you know, to not die. I know nothing about that. You know nothing. She has, she has two, uh, she, she's, a, she's a, a mother and I am an auntie. Uh, so when I found myself again in this place I say I hate, I hate being here. Yeah, but you're here. When I recognize that things that I didn't know I was doing, my behavior, my actions brought me to this place that I say, I really don't like being here again. Taking responsibility for my actions was my first step toward maturity and autonomy. And I was 35, so please don't wait that long. <laughs> so, and, but in that moment, when we, when we stop and pry open that, that we rec the, the space between impulse and action, we can pry it open bigger and bigger and bigger, and then we can see our own conditioning within that moment. Um, I desire food. I desire sex. I desire to hit some... I, I do, the, if you just stop the behavior, our mind has to expand because the energy has to go somewhere. So instead of going out, if we can direct it in, it can expand us if we let it. With some guidance from an ethical, perhaps spiritual advisor. Yeah, I love, it was in one of our emails, you said that, that we have to make sure we work in that really slim space between impulse and action. And especially around sexuality, it can be a really slim space for a lot of us. But to, to just be able to hold that moment. And, and it's a universal problem. It's not just a church problem because of many people got very negative shaming messages from their faith communities or their, their church growing up. So they fled religion realized that if someone realized, that, oh, this is problematic, this is something I have to deal with. So we, and? so we approach mental health professionals, except the mental health professionals grew up in the same culture. And I, I know the Bible gets a lot of flack for some really problematic things it says. And there, there are really, really problematic things in the scripture. And I'm not here to apologize for it or try and erase it or try and explain it in a different way. This isn't a Bible class. It, it isn't. And it's just... You know, the Bible really reflects the best and worst of humanity. So there's terrible stuff in there. It's not an instruction manual for how to live in many ways. It's not. Um, so it, so people are running from what they think. They've been told, well, the Bible says sex is bad, and they go to mental health professionals who, until very recently, it wasn't the Bible. It was the DSM that pathologized sexual feeling, homosexuality, BDSM. BDSM, kinky, sort of non-traditional behaviors. I mean, in my lifetime, those, any forms of BDSM was seen as deviant. Mentally and ill. And was treatable. And so you, being mentally so ill. So God it's, said have, it's bad, and then the therapists say it's bad. So I'm, I'm trying to we, heal from my trauma to go to someone who says, actually, you really, you really are sick, actually. Because, so it's a physician heal thyself situation. Um, so until I can sit with my own discomfort, first I have to recognize I'm uncomfortable about this, and I have to sit with it and not dump it on my, my congregant or my client or my patient because not helpful, um, and it's also not kind, and it is not responsible for, for if I'm in a position of authority, I cannot dump my shit on the people who I'm trying to help. Not okay. Not Okay. And, yeah, and I've witnessed that go bad in a church setting where someone opens up and is really shamed for what they say. 
I've witnessed it and personally experienced it go really bad in a therapeutic setting. Um, and I can only imagine what happens with sex workers and their clients when even worse comes up. So, except now that we have a growing cadre of sex positive therapists who are working from uh, a more healthful starting point, um, a lot of them are here at Woodhull, actually. Uh, so the and so there, are, there are religious people out there. We're we're a small you're, you're group, but when I go out, especially I get to spend a lot of time in and around Boston and groups. So when I go to conferences and stuff, I, I find. Well, in my denomination, we're, we're fairly progressive, and I find a lot of very queer spaces and very sex-positive spaces within my faith community, which is really, really heartening for me. So I, I think the change is happening, but it's, it's slow. And the, the people in this room are the ones who are going to be the change. And we're all on journeys. We're, either, we're on spiritual journeys. We're, we're, we're seeking. We're seeking meaning. We're seeking answers. We're seeking community. community and we're seeking... We're asking questions about the divine and whether we come down the side if we believe in God or we don't. Most people ask the question and engage in that journey. And we're you know, seeking the why are we here and who are we and what does it mean to be human? And then once we know those two things, how do the way we understand those actions inform how we behave and how we relate to one another? So it, it can sometimes be a really slim space to get there. Very slim space. So, but how can how la, la, how can we create space? So um, back, oh my goodness, it was 30 years ago. I was uh, growing up. I was really uncomfortable with religion. I was really uncomfortable with the concept of grace and forgiveness because I could not be in my body. I could not feel my own pain. I didn't know what I needed. I just knew that. Ugh. Um, so clearly something was going on. Uh, so then um, I read something that was like, oh, that's so helpful. Ritual isn't sacred. It allows the sacred to emerge. Why well, hadn't I heard that before? Um, it was a really, really powerful moment for me because I realized the, the ritual isn't sacred. I, you can make a ritual out of anything. The morning cup, but, what, but what my parents' teacher, Suzuki Roshi, said, whatever we give our attention to is enlightenment. Whatever we give our full attention to, zazen, making love, masturbating, whatever, our spirits can show up there because if we're just, if we just slow down. So the Sabbath ritual of lighting candles on Friday, the Sunday ritual of going to church, the Friday night ritual of my hot day with my sweetie pie, uh, we create space so we can show up. We decide that this is a line, this is the, this, this is the daytime, and this is our special, this is a special time. And there's a process. You don't just, you can't just come home from work, drop your bag and go, honey, I'm here for you. It's like, no, you take a bath, you work in the garden, you have a glass of wine, you, you do something to put the regular day aside and prepare to enter sacred space. But you have to build the sacred space. So you and I have to decide, okay, what do these, what does the actions mean for us? What are the important actions for us? You know, I need to light a candle. You need to have eye gazing, whatever it is. So we have to decide what's sacred to me. What, what makes, what actions can I take that help me show up here? And that, that idea that the ritual itself isn't what's sacred. It allows the sacred to emerge. I love that you got it out of Buddhism. It's also through the Christian tradition. Uh, the Benedictines have a, a practice of treating everything, absolutely everything, as if it were a tool of the altar. So whatever you are working with in the moment, that is a holy, sacred object that is going to allow you to do the work of God in the world and the sacred to emerge. And it doesn't and matter God, what it is. You to feel God's presence within you within, yeah. as, a, as, a, as a presence, as a feeling. And, and that philosophy extends to other people as well, and hospitality is, is a really core value in that religious community. So that, that idea that ritual allows the sacred to emerge really transcends faith practices. Um, yes. So we, we've talked a lot about meaning, and I'd like, yeah, we've, we've had a, because before we get too deep into ritual, we've had a lot of discussion about meaning and sex and what does it mean. And it, 
we'll unpack this a little bit. It can mean whatever we decide it means, but it, it's really important for us to know and be mindful of the fact that it always means something. We were raised in this culture, and whether we want to admit it or not, we bring to our own sexuality and our own sexual encounters learned meaning and internalized meaning. And so we have to do some work on, all right, so the, what, the message I, what are the messages I've been told do I believe them? Do they align with what I believe about what my community expects, what, what God expects, if that's, if that's part of the equation for you? It is for me. Um, and am the meaning, am I trying to form healthy meaning or am I trying to act in any way, any way, any way at all that will show I am running as far as I can, as fast as I can from what I was told it means and is wrong because fleeing isn't, we're either running towards something or running away from something. So we need to make sure we're running towards something really meaningful for ourselves. So, or be still and let it show up, right? Cause each, the smallest unit of sexuality is a human, is an individual human person. And so before it's like a self-driving car, before I want to take my self-driving car onto the road, I want to make sure my software is good, the programming is right, all the gears work, and that's personal work. Um, and for some of us, uh, being celibate for a while, if we're having unhealthy sexual patterns, and we recognize, I don't want to hurt myself this, or other people this way anymore. Some of us need to pull back and just not have contact with other people for a while, six months, five years, but everyone's different, until we can, until we hopefully just start making sure that our um, behavior is honorable and kind to ourselves as well as another person. We get to have kindness too. And the first person who gets to have our kindness hopefully is us. I'm still working on that one myself. We often find it easier to be kinder to you. But the amazing thing, if we're all manifestations of divine energy, me being nice to you is being nice to me, right? Mm -hmm. That's just a fact. And you can... I, I could tell how far along I was on this path by when I first was younger, I could not hold eye contact for more than probably 1.5 seconds. You look at me, I, I'm always the first to look away. Males, females, older, younger, I just couldn't do it. As I've done my personal work and no longer as scared of what's in me and I've done some healing, I can now actually be present in another's gaze and not be scared of what they see. What? Wait, what? Get out. And so going back to the infant, so, so, so babies or like babies or no babies, all they want, I can make a baby laugh without touching it. Anybody can by just eye gazing it and just saying, I see you, I see you, you're the best baby. You're the, and and they'll, they'll start and they, they get it. So the eyes, the eye gazing goes right to the part of the brain that connect, that, that, that feels love and connection and worth. I can, you can tell by my looking at how that I value you and I'm happy to see you. That took me 30 years to get to. Worth it, but ow. I just want to back up a little bit and make sure that something was heard. Like, this is worth taking a pause on. You said that when we, while we're doing that work of figuring out what does sex mean for us and what do we value, that sometimes, I think a lot of the time, that means taking a break, focusing on ourselves, not, not rushing into sex with other people, being celibate for a while, learning about ourselves. And I just want to point out that advice came from the porn star, not the minister. And so I get afforded a whole lot of respectability because of what I choose to do for a living that Nina doesn't. And it breaks my heart because she deserves it all. And what I get asked a lot, well, why, why are we doing this work together? Because, you know, you know she does porn, right? Yeah, I, I do, actually. Um, <laughs> we covered that. Uh, why are we doing this work together? That's why. Because this is one of the healthiest voices I've ever heard about human sexuality in my life. Because she's done the work of knowing herself and knowing her body and giving herself permission to say, 
okay, my desires and my thoughts are okay. I'm not going to run from them. I'm going to parse out what can be manifested in the world and what can't. So where I get a, a ton of respectability, deserved or not, just by virtue of what I do and the circles I'm allowed to move in, one of the great things about being able to work together is Nina has an incredible amount of credibility that in a way that I don't, because if I were talking to a group of younger people or a group of college students saying, you know, maybe you want to wait and figure yourself out first, they're going to look at me, they're, they're going to look at the way I'm dressed, they're going to know she's a minister, and just with the messages we've been given, probably assume, well, she has to say that, that's not really helpful, thanks. But it is, but, it is helpful. You know, I've, I've been directly sexual with tens of thousands of people. From a hug to, whoa, my hand fits there. <laughs> well, yes, yes, it does. <laughs> so the, and as a, I'm also a nurse. I'm a nurse by training. I was going to be a midwife. And what really got me to this, anyone here ever had a baby? So you have had that amazing journey. And so I grew up in the 70s. And so assuming a healthy pregnancy with a healthy woman and the baby in the right position, the mom, she's, it, the person is going to have the baby. The person in labor is going to produce a baby. All we can do as midwives is we chant some, rub the back some, walk some, tub some, shower some, nap some, <sighs> chant some, rub some, until the baby comes. The baby is going to be here. Her body can do this. And as someone had, who had to learn to be orgasmic, I had to midwife myself. I had to midwife my own pleasure. And it turns out, given the right non-judgmental, no ego support, any body, most bodies can achieve what we call orgasm. It takes a lot of gentling to get us to come back into our bodies. They've been stolen from us from such an early age by so many different ways. And we were, this is just normal child rearing. We're not even talking about people who have layers of also abuse or sexual exploitation. Just normal child rearing divorces the child from its body because it, the adults, because they are unhealed, they... The original sin is not the apple. The original sin is adults dumping their shit on their kids and perpetuating that cycle generation after generation after generation and calling it normal. Child, this child rearing. No, it's actually really mean what we do to kids. And instead of teaching them, sweetheart, not in the living room, darling, we just say no. Cause, and, and what happens, because we are unhealed and unexamined, the first time our child does something, there's that impulse action. I was, I was slapped one time in my entire life, and it happened, I was about eight, and the look of horror on my mother's face she told me that she was horrified at her own behavior and that her mother must have done it to her. Well, one time, it wasn't, a, but it was just one of the, I looked up at her and she was like, and I was shocked because it had never happened before, it never happened again, and so when the adults do not do the work, it just gets dumped on the kids because the ch child, and the child has to, modify its behavior because if it does not please the adult, it will die. So the child learns to, I'm going to squish myself because if mommy doesn't, is not happy with me, I'm going to die. So I don't know my needs. I need, I, so I look to you to give me meaning as opposed, so most adults end up dumping their stuff on their kids instead of helping the child with the child's stuff and protecting the child from the adult stuff. All right, kids look to us to give each other meaning and if we're going to talk about original sin, then I'll give my interpretation. That's not a Bible class. The original sin isn't the apple. It isn't this horrible woman who, you know, led Adam down a path. It isn't even the snake, because really, read the story. The snake's the only one that doesn't lie. <laughs> you can fact check me on that. Uh, the original sin or the original problem of creation was loneliness. It was a lack of companionship. The first thing, again, if we go back to that myth, and read the you know, things that are created, they were good, like it was good, it was very good. The first thing that isn't either good or very good, the first thing that is not good is it is not good for a human to be alone. So God creates a companion. So the very first problem is lack of companionship. And the solution to that is God creating another human being. So I, I would want to say to people who say, well, sex is for procreation, and God gave it to us to procreate. God doesn't need us, clearly, 
to make more of us. God made two of us with no help at all. God had already made all the animals, everything that creeps on the ground, every, the birds of the air, the plants of the field, the fish in the waters, absolutely everything with no help. So, yes, we, as a matter of practicality, we need sex to make more of us. And it is a way that, it is the way we make more of us, and that was the commandment, go forth and populate the earth. However, it can't possibly be the sole reason we were given sexuality or sexual desires, because God doesn't need sex to make more of us, not according to the scripture we claim to follow. So as someone who believes in evolution, so whether we are made in the image of God or we evolved out of primordial soup, clearly the sexual pleasure cycle is really important to humans and to human culture and to human society, or we wouldn't have a clitoris. We would be like gibbons, gibbons of all the great apes, gibbons mate, and then they spend the rest of the year raising a single child and do not have sex, do not mate again until that infant is ready to go. So they're super monogamous. Gibbons are like way monogamous. <laughs> And they have sex during their mating season, and then they raise their child together. Humans are really different, and most humans have way more sexual encounters than they have children. You know, and for someone like me, we're talking thousands of acts of intercourse and no baby. <laughs> uh, of course, the way I do it would be unlikely to be inseminated through my breasts. But anyway, <laughs> so I didn't. So, uh, so my understanding, so, so Ellen comes at it as it, it is a divine, a divine opportunity to, for connection. And I say, well, if humans, if sexual pleasure wasn't important, it wouldn't work in our brains the way that it does. It wouldn't be a spiritual experience the way that it is. And we wouldn't need it. And females would definitely not have the incredibly complex sexual response cycle that most female people have been blessed with. Um, we would have just a uterus and a birth canal. We wouldn't need a clitoris and all those parts in the brain that are so yummy when you get petted. Um, but we do. And if a human, if a mammal mother does not touch her child, it will starve. So something in us, you know, after this experience, we have to reach for the baby as opposed to, I'm going to kill you because you just hurt me. I mean, I hear, you know, mothers when, you know, the, the rush of oxytocin after screaming at the birth partner, I hate you, I hate you, I'm going to kill you. Can we do this again? Can we have another? It's like, wow, Mother Nature, God's smart. <laughs> because no woman would have a second baby if, if our brains did not work a certain way. Well, you were not in the delivery room for either of my children. I was not. So. Clearly, if you think it was, can we do this again? <laughs> I've, I've heard it. I've heard, I've I mean, we did, <laughs> obviously, but it, 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 it was not, that was not said that day. Um, it, I've, it I've, I've, I've seen it happen. It's, it's amazing. It's like, oh, wow, oxytocin is really powerful. So if we, we were going down the path of meaning. So if we're going to like not, if we're going to set aside some time, be with ourselves, be with our bodies, and think about what does this mean to me and what do I value about my sexuality and what, what do I value about other people's bodies and sexuality and how do I want those, those things to, to interact and interface in my, in my life, what aligns with my values. You have a lot of really good ways of expressing what, what different things sex can mean and, and how to be okay with that with yourself and also discuss with your partner. Like I may think one thing, my partner may think another. How do we get on the same page? So if we talk about meaning making a little bit. Certainly. So the, it's really, oh, talk to your partner, discuss it with your partner. Way easier said than done. Can we say how hard it is to say to your partner, I want a thing or I don't want that thing anymore. And because I can often tell exactly how old a person was when they first saw my movie because no matter how old the physical body is, when they approach me, oh, you were 14. Oh, you saw me when you were younger than that. Oh, 16. Because they just, they automatically, the first time they meet me, drop into the space they were when they first encountered me. And I 
very much made sure that no matter who found me when, they're watching a woman having a genuinely good time doing things she genuinely liked with a genuinely good attitude. So there is, anyone here know Hegel? I know this much Hegel. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. I'm about to have a lisp. So the thesis is, I want, and the antithesis is, you can't. Struggle, 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 struggle. Drugs, drinking, self-harm, 10 marriages. Eventually, you either go crazy or you change your belief system. And you come to synthesis, which is your new understanding of yourself. So on my thesis was, all consensual behavior is okay. Versus how I really felt about when I confronted consensual behavior. But recognizing that if the external is consenting, then my feelings about it are mine to handle. My emotions are mine to handle. I don't get to say, so a little kid says, you stop that, you're making me uncomfortable, versus an adult goes, whoa, thank you for letting me see part of myself. I'm going to go work with that for a minute. And But we encourage in our culture people to treat sexuality as children. You poopy head, you stop that, you hurt my feelings, you don't do that anymore. Um, not useful. And there's a reason we call it adult behavior. Adults get to have sex, but most of us have a 12-year-old driving a car. There's a reason 12-year-olds don't get to drive cars, <laughs> including this car. But I don't, know how old your, I don't know how old your driver is, but mine was really young for a long time, and it got me in a really bad way, a really bad situation. First marriage. Um, so, uh, and it took me 20 years to extricate myself because I didn't understand my worth, and I didn't understand my own responsibility to my own experience and my own responsibility toward my behavior. I kept waiting for you to change so I could be happy. A little codependent, just a tad, and also really useless and was never going to work. Because if I put my happiness on you to provide, A, that disempowers me and gives you way too much power. Because what if you're not a nice person? What if the person to whom you give your power to isn't, good with it or misuses it or is mean about it. It's really harmful. So learning how to accept my desire, I want these things. Can any of them be manifest? Should any of this manifest? If I want something that's a 10 on the scale, can doing it in real life at a two, would that be enough? And then fill in the rest with my head. So how do I titrate? What's so important? I must physically have it in my life. And what could stay in my head? Because, hey, you know, I'm never going to have sex in space, so I'll just think about it. Um, did that help? Yeah, and, and that over, overlaps with you know, that sort of sexual explorative journey overlaps with spiritual journey really well in my mind. Because for me, I believe that spiritual practice, faith practice, religious practice and experience happens in community. And it really needs to happen in community. However, how we get to that community and find a community that's meaningful to us and fulfilling to us, that journey is very individual and very personal. And where I see it can go wrong a lot is people who say, I want that experience of community. So they select a faith community and then say, oh, these are the rules I have to follow to have a relationship with God. Instead of bringing with them their faith journey and their questions and, well, what is it that authentically connects me to the divine? And then how do I find the community where we express that and live that together? And that, that sounds very much the same. Like, well, what, it, what is sex to me? And what is what needs to stay in my head? What do I want to manifest in the world? What is special or set aside in a way for me that's for one partner, if you're monogamous, what if, you know, there's stuff that, there are things that, you know, you're non-monogamous or will you have other partners and, you know, how do we, we have to know that about ourselves before we live it out with other people and also before we can live it out in faith community. I mean, one of the, you talk about Hegel, one of the people I go back to all the time, one of my favorite theologians is Walter Brueggemann who talks about, oh, I forget what book it's in, sorry. Uh, but he talks about the Torah being settled. It is the law, it is written, it is settled. What it means is a question. 
And it's a responsibility to keep asking the questions. And he said this beautiful thing that if we're he, uh, he's obviously writing for a Jewish faith community, but this is equally a- applicable, I think, across the board. If we are going to take seriously our faith traditions, our beliefs, what we value, and pass it on to the next generation, not only may we question everything, we must. We're required to keep asking the questions. We can't even treat the God question as settled, because if we do, we'll become complacent. I like that. Because we're seeking people. You know, my parents were seekers, so humans are meaning-seeking creatures and meaning-making creatures. That's Ellen's line. And so I'm going to talk about my second um, spiritual what? And this is where Ellen's head will explode. So um, I had recently left a very contentious 20-year marriage where I had been repressed, suppressed, oppressed, (laughs) all oppressed, and just fled. I was not able to leave it elegantly. I basically ran from a burning house with my hair on fire going, get me out of here. And because I was so healthy at the time, I quickly embarked on a consensual um, relationship with a friend from high school. And it was for the, for six months I had for the only time in my life, monogamous fantasies, (laughs) monogamous feelings. And I thought, too bad I can't be married and have a baby because I wanted to marry him and have his baby. So I knew it was temporary insanity because you don't, at 40, all of a sudden think, I want a baby with this person, right? So I recognized it as a mania. I was just finally free. I was just the, like the dam and, and the water shooting out 10 feet before it, it goes down. And so we were having an encounter in my living room. And uh, he, and I wasn't even touching him. He was as far away, f- you know, from me as you are or her. And I just had this incredible physiological sensation of, of not melting, but just evaporation and peace and just a, a very intense emotional experience that I'd never, ever had before or since. Um, and I thought in the middle of it, uh, thanks to then, huh, if I had the God story, this is the moment that people say, when, this, is the, this is the moment people are trying to describe when they say, I was saved, God healed me, Jesus entered my heart. But I don't have the God language, so I recognize that that state of being is a physiological body state that can be created through many different means, through our bodies, through our nervous systems, acting on our brains. We can create a space of And if we do it properly through prayer or our body, we can get there any time because it's always, it's always available to us because our bodies, we are in it all the time. Now, Ellen hates that term, and I'm going to let her take it from here. You know what you did. <laughs> so imagine, so a ta- imagine a table, and she's now going to go, bing. You might have accidentally unleashed my inner preacher here. So the, <laughs> the phrase, I was saved, makes me table flipping angry. <laughs> I'm open to a lot of different interpretations. Um, Soteriology and salvation, I'm not. I will go to the mat on this. The sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, it was atoning an atoning sacrifice where blood was shed for the redemption of all, not for each. It is a corporate salvation. It is a corporate salvation. Either we're all saved or none of us are saved. Either we're all redeemed or none of us are redeemed. We are in this together because we are all equally made in the image and the likeness of divine. Image of God, meet image of God. We're all going or none of us are. And honestly, I believe, I don't know what happens when we die. I don't. Um, I don't know what's going to happen at the end of time. I don't, and I don't really care. I care more about how we treat each other as holy divine beings today in the here and now and live out kindness, compassion, social justice here and now. I don't care what comes next. I'm here now. God put me here now. So I'm not about saving myself. I'm about helping other people along on their journey and trying to heal damage and harm where I can and using the voice I have in the platform I have to do that and but I do believe that 
wherever we're going, it is all the same place. So if we, if we have a good relationship with, I'll say God, or we have peace with our understanding of how the universe w- works, and we have understanding of what ethical values are and how we need to treat ourselves and treat our bodies and treat other people and other people's bodies. And we really live into that, whether we're doing it because we're honoring the divine that's within another person or we're doing it because human beings have dignity. They have dignity and we cannot take it and we cannot damage it without damaging our own. So we're going to treat each other well because it's the right thing to do, whether there's we have a God story or that language or not. I believe if we are, if we really live our values, when we die, we're going to, we're going to have just eternal bliss because we're going to be live, living in harmony with the divine or with whatever the universal truth is. And our lives will have been in alignment with that. And so whatever comes after will be eternal bliss. If we didn't, if we say we believe one thing and act another way, if we harm one another, if we condemn the behavior in another person that we do in ourselves, we're out of alignment and eternity is going to burn like fire because we will, we are going to end up in the constant, intimate, fully enmeshed presence of whatever the universal truth is. So if that's a comfortable place for us to be, we're in heaven. If that's not a comfortable place for us to be, we're in hell. And we're so, all going the same place. I like that. So some people say hell is other people, and some say hell is absence of other people. So about treating people well. So when I was trying to align my behavior with my values, my value was I'm not a monogamous person. My behavior was I was still riven with jealousy and riven with insecurity. And so my partner at the time, I think I was 19 or 20, and I'm a hedonist. I'm going to say so. I was jealous. And jealous, jealousy. I'm like Gollum. I don't like feeling this. I was looking for a note from her. And I was looking for something. And it's like this. I don't want to live here. I don't, I don't want to live here. Yeah, I want to live up here. And, oh. It took me 20 years to change, make the change, but it's possible. And the so hap, kindness. So you, you, you kindness is a practice. Healthy sexuality is a practice. You practice sex. If people who here who do tantra, at the sex practice. My parents had a meditation practice. You have a prayer and so, uh, social service justice practice. So we practice it. Uh, Sherry Huber, the Zen teacher, says, we, "What we practice is what we get." So if I constantly sitting and I hate this, I hate, I hate, I hate, that's what I get. I get hate and, and disappointment and you're, you're unsatisfying to me and you're not giving me my needs. And, mm, mm, that's not helping. So when we can work being kind, you know what? I'm going to t- walk around the block an extra time. I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm going to have a cup of tea instead of a cup of something stronger. I'm going to start being nice to myself, my body, and but when we're nice to our body, then all the pain comes up because finally there's space for the pain to emerge. And so we have to go through our, our pain healing with ritual. I started with uh, uh, massage therapy practice, meaning receiving sent kind touch of a non-sexual nature. And I realized I was so body armored growing up that it took me five years to learn how to breathe into my belly. Take a deep breath. Sort of hard to do when you're so tight. We've been so stopping your emotions for so long that you cannot breathe because you cannot accept how much pain you're in, or how much rage you feel, or how lonely you are, all the strong feelings. So you've got to just start with little, bit, little, little steps. Gentling yourself into your body. I'm going to go walk barefoot in a creek. Oh, that feels so good. Oh, I'm going to lie in the sun and take, oh, that feels so, so, oh, it feels good. And so non-sex, non-genital at first, but sensual, oh, oh, I can be, okay, I can be here. And obviously people have different layers of experience. There's more to work through. Um, So, okay, because most people, again, normally conditioned are quite, not stunted, but quite constrained. Add on to that other forms of violence. Um, and you have more layers to work through. But the amazing thing is your body's always there. You can always do it. 30 seconds, a minute, 
ooh, ooh, five minutes straight. So the work is always available to you when you care to turn your attention to it. Some days I'm stronger. I can go through more intense. I won't call it pain. I can go through more challenging emotions and stay in my body. Took a long time. But if you do, if you can really feel your feelings, they'll pass. If you don't, you're always stuck in most people. So if false feelings are a bell curve, so beginning of feeling, highest intensity and resolution. Um, all feelings have that bell curve or we'd still feel the stub toe from when we were two, right? All, it's, our nervous system is amazing. So most people, so we have, and so happy feeling, I wanna be happy all the time. This is very challenging. So I'm gonna check out if the highest point is five plus five and then minus four down to zero. Most people do their checking out mechanism at two or three whatever the checkout mechanism is. And so they never progress in that journey past the checkout point. So learning how to keep going with the discomfort till it pops and you have the new resolution, the new understanding, the new awareness, and then you can slide into it. Um, I took many years to do this, but you don't have to. We all do it somehow. <laughs> well, and when we talk about part of you know, self-tending and self-care and particularly for people who try and help other people navigate their own challenges. It, this came up in seminary a lot. Like, what is your self-care practice? And I want to stop using that word because it reached, phrase, because it recently came to my attention that we've just like straight lifted that from Audre Lorde and her very particular context. And it's, self-care is not white women taking a bubble bath because it feels good. It's not, and we have to stop using that. So I'm trying really hard to change my phrasing to, because it's such a, an important concept, maybe self-tending, I'm thinking, might be better to pay attention to our own needs and make sure we're meeting our own needs so that that well isn't empty when someone else comes to us. So in seminary, it's, there's a big focus on, well, what is your personal faith practice and how are you going to remain faithful to that and how are you going to stay grounded in that so that you have that spirit that spiritual guidance in that place to offer to someone else. So we talk about um, daily sensual practice or daily sexual practice. So how are we going to keep that well full and be comfortable with ourselves so we can help someone else navigate that journey, especially where the two intersect. So how do we tend to that? And the one of the things that people get told all the time, I'm guilty of saying it a lot, is like, well, the place to start is obviously just, you know, just breathe, just take a deep breath. Okay, I have asthma. Like sometimes taking a deep breath is gonna, is gonna trigger a panic attack that you wouldn't believe because I, I can take a deep breath in. I can't get that air out. That's not relaxing. <laughs> so, and it's sort of, it, that's become this universal, well, breathing's easy for everybody. It, it's not. And I really wanna thank my six-year-old son the other day who was, spiraling into a meltdown and I I really I wanted him to calm down because it's hard for me to see him that upset and we were just, we were at home we're in our own kitchen he's six he doesn't have to be socially appropriate in that moment I just don't want to see my child in pain so I was trying to speed him through his process and I, I said to him okay my darling child were I, I used his name but I, I, we're being live streamed so I'm not gonna name them um, I said to me, we're, I said, okay, I see you're frustrated. We can work this out. I want you to take a deep breath. And, and God bless him because this was such a teachable moment for me. He balled up his fists, stomped his foot, looked me in the eye, and he said, I'm not going to breathe. I'm angry, and I'm going to tell you why. I couldn't do that at six. And so I just sat down on the floor near him and I said, tell me why. And he needed that time. He needed to get through his process. He, he, he's very, he's very sensory. He has some sensory. He, it, anger isn't just an emotion from his brain. He feels it in his body and he needed to, to clench and stomp and move and yell and move that energy out. It wasn't, a, well, if we sit quietly and take a deep breath, you'll feel better. That was like the worst advice I could have given him. And I'm so grateful for him for that lesson because you know what? I, I knew better and I said it anyway. So when we talk about developing a daily sensual practice or a daily sexual practice, uh, it's not even 
are you going to masturbate every day? It starts as simply as what is the feeling that gets me into my body? What is the feeling that feels good to my body? What is the way I can move or the way I can visualize in my mind a, a part of myself or just let me feel a part of myself? Like, what is that for me? Like, even the answer of, you know, start with your breath. Like, no one else is going to give you that answer. You need to spend time, we all need to spend time with our own bodies and say, well, what is it for me that's calming for me? What does my nervous system need? Because maybe, maybe it is movement. Maybe it is touch. Maybe it is strong sensation. Or singing. Or, so um, I went to nursing school, and I was going to be a midwife, and I uh, graduated, got my license, got my diploma, and realized I wasn't emotionally prepared to be a nurse because I could not handle other suffering because I had not addressed my own suffering. And so as a codependent person, you're suffering. I want to help you, and I, but I can't help you by jumping into the water with you and us both thrashing around. Um, so uh, it took me a long time to address my own suffering and, and to be able to be strong for another person and to do my own personal work so that your suffering, I can have enough to help you as opposed to be drained by it or... Um, lose my compassion for your situation. Um, you know, caregiver burnout's a thing. Um, uh, and it's important that caregivers, spiritual caregivers, physical caregivers, child caregivers, take restorative time for themselves so that they can renew that energy, fill the well up. And um, a, a non-sexual massage, so body armor, we've all struggled with that, I, I, I dare say. And... I'm a very touchy person, and it took me a long time to learn how to receive touch and give touch, but I knew I needed it. I'm su- my body boundaries are really low, <laughs> really low. And Ellen talks about, but I, I remember how in the beginning, if you touched me, I, would, I couldn't, I couldn't relax. I would just, even though I knew I needed it, I could not take it. And Ellen talks about how difficult it is for some people even to have their foot touched. Um, uh, but one thing that's really, really lacking, I think, particularly in the Protestant religion, is any sort of embodied expression of our our faith. So not only are we are we terrified of our bodies in our private life, we're terrified of our bodies in our public worship spaces. And I come up against this every year on Maundy Thursday, which is part of um, Holy Week, and it frequently involves a ritual of foot washing, which is it is in the scripture. It's and it's really, really hard for people. It's really hard, and I I find it really, really powerful, and it's one of those things. It was a practice Jesus introduced, Jesus commanded, and so if if we're going to say as Protestants, well, you know, a lot of these things we see as sacraments, they're too Catholic, so we're going to neglect them. It It's on us to keep the ones that we're saying, Jesus himself said, I command you to do this. Foot washing's one of them. And... So every year I have this, this discussion with people. I, it's a beautiful ritual. It's really, really hard for people, and it's really, really hard to convince people that we can touch each other with the most distal parts of our anatomy for, like, literally a minute and a half, and no one's going to die, I promise. But I be will okay. be exposed to the fact that I need this touch, don't have this touch, don't know how to get this touch, and feel bad for wanting this touch. You know. <laughs> and it's just from foot washing. And because it can be an amazingly intimate experience. Yeah. And we have about 25 minutes left. Do we, um, do we want to um, open up for questions? And I shall repeat your question so you're not going to be on camera. Yes, ma'am. I chose to sit here because I wanted... It just makes it much, much easier. You're being live streamed. Do you know that? Is it okay with you? Oh, okay. I came to sit here because I want to represent for sexuality, spirituality, and suicidality. Um, I do creative maladjustment, and you are the prostitute and you are the minister and I'm the witch doctor and I'm representing here for African American woman experience and I came to sit here because I felt you were getting a little hard for me to listen to and this is how I stay present 
So I did it to stay present and to remind both of you that I was in the space uh, and I do authentic movement and I do radical expression when I need to do something to stay present. So thank you very much. And ISIS is what I wanted to say as a, a comment. Gina Ogden is a sex uh, therapist and she talks about integrating spirituality and sexuality. And the nuns are going to meditative space and having orgasms and getting very confused. And, and the sex workers are having out-of-body experiences that are taking them all kinds of amazing places. As and getting very confused. So we're getting good at this. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and thank you for moving the way you did because it did make me very aware that you were here. And I was like, wow, you're really here for this. And it, it, thank you for that. And thank you for sharing why you did it. And because that also is going to give, hopefully, other people permission to do that if they don't feel seen, to make yourself seen because it's so important. And I, I did see you and really appreciated it so thank you and maybe next year this is a panel of three because if we get a witch doctor in this we're at that get my card <laughs> okay my name is victoria okay uh nina you said um all consensual behavior is okay um and you said my emotions are mine to handle that's what you said um so I was wondering how that works when the person consenting is a child. I had an experience as a child, and this, is, and this was before I was taught that certain touch, touches are inappropriate, or before I learned, because no one ever told me. Um, and so I had an experience when I was six years old with a 12-year-old, and... Um, he asked if he could touch me. He asked if it was okay. And, and he's like, I'm not going to hurt you. And, and, you know, in retrospect, I was thinking he was a child. I was a child. And I consented. And I enjoyed the experience as a six-year-old child. And when I got older, I felt like some shame and guilt about it because people told me it was a bad touch. You know, he wasn't supposed to touch you like that. And it was wrong. And I'm like, but it didn't feel wrong in the moment. So I did... I, it, it took me a while to process that, and then later I just was like, it, it didn't seem wrong. So I, I couldn't figure out what or why, because consent was there, and, and it, it didn't. This is, well, and I'm, I'm definitely going to let Nina answer as well, because this, this is one of the places we overlap quite a bit. Consent is really important. It's a really important issue for me. Um, and sometimes it's seen as the be-all, end-all. As long as we have enthusiastic consent, it's fine. It's necessary but not sufficient. We also have to consider what, what, a lot, what, is, what aligns with our values and consider the other person as well. So are we in a position to possibly harm another person? And you, 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 you expressed this so well. Children are naturally sensual. And again, until our bodies are taken from us by people telling us, you can't have that. We like to hug things and climb things and squeeze things. And we love our teddy bear. And the, and the arm of the couch is really sort of fun to ride like a horse. And it's the adult shaming us that causes the harm. In retrospect, he was a child as well. You had a positive experience. It didn't hurt you. I'm not going to say that was wrong. If he had been older, that would have been wrong. Yeah, that would have been much too big of a power imbalance. But you could have been an old six. You could have been a young 12. No, and so you're both eight, <laughs> you know, emotionally. Um, but the fact that it was positive for you is, is wonderful because our bodies are meant to have pleasure. They're the reason that they're put together the way that they do because pleasure will touch. I want to get to know you more. I'm going to be nice to you. So it, it creates bonds. Um, and... So whether it's a sporting event, a praying event, or an orgy, you know, we have a group of people coming together for the same purpose. It creates tremendous energy. And have you ever been to a live sporting event? You're going to go deaf. So um, I think kids can play together consensually and not have it be a problem. And that might get me hanged by the feminist thought police, but I really don't care. Um, we were all kids once. We all played doctor or something I'm sure because bodies are fun and they have 
they do things and they're fun and this is fun and kids guys should get to have fun. Um, well, well, no, I just, your, your prime directive is don't use sex to harm self or others. So that there, there's, yes, there's the consent piece, but there's also the don't harm self or others piece. So that the don't harm self or others is really internal work. What's going to harm me and what's going to harm someone else. And that's going to be very different for me. It's going to be different for you. It's going to be different for Nina. So that's sometimes why I say consent isn't enough. And if you know, uh, most of the work I do is with adults. So I'm a, a little uncomfortable. I'm just going to own it. I'm uncomfortable with the, the ages, especially as the mom of a six-year-old. So I'll own that. But so as a general statement, I'm going to say, if, if you weren't harmed, if you didn't feel harmed, if you felt like your behavior was, was a authentic choice of your own, don't let anyone tell you that their definition of what's an acceptable choice is the right one and yours is wrong. Thank you. Thank you so much for having this panel. I'm just so filled with joy getting to hear both of you speak. And I'm wondering, what is, where else are these discussions happening, specifically in spiritual communities? Um, I'm surprised to have you here and really, really excited this conversation is taking here, taking place here in, in a safe space of um, sexual freedom. But I'm wondering within the spiritual com communities, where is it safe currently to speak about sexuality? Um, it's not, and I'm taking a huge risk here, honestly. Um, <laughs> I'm, and now I'm going to walk that back a little bit. Um, there are people having this discussion. I, I know people who are now in ministry who have been sex workers. Uh, I know people in ministry who are in non-traditional polyamorous relationships, um, which is the church is having a really hard time with. Um, so they try and keep it secret. I know people who are both devoutly Christian and quite kinky and try and keep that secret. So the discussions are kind of are happening, but they're happening very privately, very quietly in corners of meetings in, you know, coffee shops near school where we don't think anyone else is going to be in, you know, through text messages. It, and it's a very, very close, the, the community is there to, to have the discussion, but it's the most closeted of closeted communities. The people who are identified as both devoutly Christian, and I, I don't know if that's broader for other faith traditions, so I'll just speak to my own, and queer or queer in some way. I identify as queer, so I use that word. Um, and I, I think it can be a pretty encompassing term. So where else are they happening? Not really and anywhere. And that's part of the reason I'm here because they need to happen and they need to come out of the shadows and out of the, out of the corners. And I mean, I've had some of my seminary professors, some of the things I learned in class and we talked about and I read about set me on this path. I remember the class I was sitting in the day it happened when I went, holy crap, there is no such thing as sacred and profane. If we're wholly created, then it's all sacred. And that means bodies and that means sex. And I talked to, I've talked to a couple professors about that and people who are you doing work in theology and being published and have names and have real gravitas in this field will say, you're right. And I agree with you. And I hope you continue in this work. Please don't quote me. <laughs> so that, that's why I'm here to be visible and hope that some of these conversations can happen in other places. You know, the, the reality is, you know, sexual suffering is real suffering. 
So my job as a nurse, my job as a person who inhabits sexual space is to role model acceptance for where you are right now. Because I would be, everything being equal for hygiene and grooming and manners, be interested in sharing sexual space with anybody who wants. But just, to sh- just to say, hi, how are you? And suffering, spiritual suffering, sexual suffering is felt in the body, it's expressed in the body, it hurts the body, epigenetics, stress hormones, all the things. And so finding a way to inhabit our bodies with some kindness is really uh, useful. Um, I just wanted to address what you just said um, because... There are um, smaller sacred communities that are doing this work in a very positive way. Um, There are actually a few of us in the room who are part of a larger community, and we had a subset of, I would say, about 200 people, and for five years we did a very, very intense um, annual sacred work with Venus, and it was all about sacred sexuality and healing and... Off making an offering of our sexuality as a, a divine experience. And there was, you know, there was a lot of pain and there was a lot of individual, you know, differences in what people were experiencing. Um, but there, it was overall um, approached as a very positive thing and that, you know, sex is very natural and, um, and that we wanted to elevate it. Um, and it included, like, my particular realm in that space was to kind of guard over the space where we had the like non-genital, non-intercourse area so that everyone could be included whether or not you particularly like wanted to, you know, do tab A, slot B, like that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, so there are, you know, some communities that are out there that are really, really focusing heavily on sex as a, a, a spiritual experience and as a divine offering. So, um, I'm happy to talk more about that with anybody who wants to have a really meaty sex nerd spirituality conversation. Our panel for next year is growing. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add to a couple more resources, uh, particularly for Christian folks, if you haven't heard about the Our Bible app, it's actually a, a counter to the religious right mass media conglomeration of violence um, and uh, particularly check out Reverend Alba Onofrio, also known as Rev Sex, uh, does a lot of sexual liberation work and works for Soul Force. Um, like their work and a whole host of other conversations are happening there, so I highly recommend that free app. Um, and as a person who does specifically just does this work at Vanderbilt Divinity School, I'll say occasionally we have some really awesome stuff happening that is, so if you want to talk about that, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, and I'm super excited that this is happening. So thank you so much. Yes. The Our Bible app is fabulous. You can sign up for the email, follow them on Twitter. I, I thank you for bringing that up. Um, also there's a book called the queer Bible commentary, which is a good read and, Another book that I really like that talks about sort of alternative, alternative sexuality and what the church would probably think is alternative and a spiritual journey would be Hardy Haberman's book, Soul of a Second Skin. It's fabulous. Um, it is, it's BDSM inclined. So, but, but he, he does do a good job of introducing it. Saying, you know, if you're not familiar with this, then I'm going to parse out your terms, but also sort of know, know your limits. And if that's not a place you want to go, it's not going to be the, the best book for you. I thought it was fabulous. I, I have to find them again to sign my copy today. So I would recommend that as well. But yeah, our Bible app. Thank you for bringing that up. Going back to what she asked, I have a special interest in victim advocacy. And so the conferences that I go to, I have noticed, I have noticed that the shift is towards more inclusiveness of religious leaders. And it is coming from a position of overcoming trauma and shame, but at least the conversation is starting. And I live in the South, and so that's huge. But trying to help religious leaders see and understand that when they're... um, congregate comes to them not to shame this with God, but try to open their eyes to help them through the trauma and have the self-actualization or actually just even to report it if that's what they feel like they need to do. But that's a trend that I've seen and just very, very recently in some of the work that I've been doing with victim advocacy. 
Thank you. What's our time? Do you want to close? So can, can I say where this comes from? Okay, so Nina has a new, speaking of resources, we're going to plug. Oh, yeah, buy her book, too. Oh, Nina Hartley's God. Guide to Total Sex. How have we been? It's like the third time we're on tape together, and we both forget. Like, oh, what are good resources? Uh. Nina wrote a book. <laughs> it's called Nina Hartley's Guide to Total Sex, and it's really open and non-judgmental. There aren't a lot of pictures. There's some beautiful line illustrations but so it it's very safe it's very safe to have in your home it's very safe to have in your office and it it sort of it is the menu of things that are available presented factually and with no judgment and it, it's a really really good resource um so yeah buy her book it's available at red emma's here and monday nina has a new website that's going live it's safe for work website, safe for work website <laughs> where where you can where you can, yeah please where you can access our her, her, all of like her body of knowledge of how to do this work with yourself how to do this work with your partners how to be comfortable in your own skin and it it is safe for work and it, it is accessible to to anybody and everybody and um, so it's www.nina.live Monday. So, yeah. So she was showing me. I got a preview the other night, and it was great. And I love it, and it's beautiful. And I can't wait to see it Monday, and I can't wait for all of you to see it Monday. Um, in, in her archive, there is a, I found, I noticed, was posted there, a reframing or a rewritten Lord's Prayer. And it's beautiful. And since I'm always put on the spot to close with prayer, I, <laughs> this is such a fun moment for me right now. <laughs> I'm going to ask Nina, the atheist, not an atheist. <laughs> I'm going to ask Nina if you would close with that prayer. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen. And thank you, Woodhull. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Press the light. Open the phone. Conscious pleasure, conscious pleasure, which is heaven, hallowed be this gift. Its bounty come, its magic be done in spirit as it is in our bodies. Give us this day our daily joy and heal our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us away from strife and anchor our community, for herein lies the bounty the power, and the beauty, ever and always. Amen. Please do, because we hope to give this talk again. Hopefully here, hopefully other places. Thank you, Woodhull, for having us and hosting this, because not many places would be brave enough to do that. Thank you all for being here and contributing your wisdom to us. And thank you, Nina, for just being a person who makes me brave in a very scared world. So thank you for all that you are to me and all that you've done for me. Don't forget those evaluation forms. <laughs>